Good evening, uh, and a warm welcome to Dr. Mark Bosford. Uh, he is a lecturer at Animation University of Derby. Tonight's presentation from Mark is titled A Deeper Picture, A Realist Semiotics of Nonfiction Film. Mark uses critical reads and exploring the ontology of nonfiction, explicitly documentary and collage, as an interface between lived experience and social historical construction of animation. Mark therefore examines the craft of creating animation by the ontological strata of CR to illuminate the mediated process which are designed and developed to convince audiences of the authenticity and representation of the real world. Since the academic fields of crime, security and justice are highly mediated, for instance, during this portion of documentary film, I believe tonight's talk from Mark will be illuminating and help us imagine how the study of animation could further our own areas of criminological expertise. Uh, welcome, Mark. Thank you. And I recently completed a practice-led PhD, and I've been working with archive materials from the National Screen and Sound Archive of Wales to address the history and identity of the Welsh Wales region. And this is the practice, which is still a work in progress. And it juxtaposes archive film elements in the spatial as well as the temporal dimensions. And it's produced through animation and visual effects techniques. And this is premised on the claim that this form of collage functions as a mode of visual research and visual sociology that can negotiate and reveal the causal complexity of historical events. Harold Rosenberg called collage a philosophy of put-togethers. Marjorie Perloff described collage as an important mode of theorizing and model building, as well as art making. But Hopkins said collage is not just a physical technique, but rather as a philosophical attitude an aesthetic position that can suffuse virtually any expressive medium. And my argument is that as a philosophical attitude, collage cuts against the reduction of illusory whole appearances by configuring the more complex world that critical realism describes. And as an art practice and as a form of communicative interaction, it's practically adequate for giving shareable form to our experiences of being in relation with the natural necessity of the world. With regards to non-fiction and documentary film, Gary McLennan has argued that many of the confusions and aporia that have plagued documentary studies, particularly with reference to truth, objectivity and realism, have either been solved or at least substantially clarified within the paradigm of critical realism. Uh, this is because debates in film realism have been characterized by a split between objectivism and subjectivism. As critical realism challenges that dualism, it can reconcile that split. And my argument includes the claim that the properties of montage provide a form of causal inference. I'll play this example. September the 11th, enemies of freedom committed an act of war against our country and night fell on a different world. A world where freedom itself is under attack. El 11 de septiembre, los enemigos de la libertad cometieron un acto bélico contra nuestro país. And in the context of the film, that cut between Bush and the plane attacking the presidential palace during Pinochet's coup says something about the historical background of American interference in the region and the causal complexity of those events. As well as being in the shots themselves, meaning and truth is within the interstitial space of the cut and how it models a deeper reality in our imaginations that can infer the non-empirical causes of events. This is how I feel film documents the non-physical parts of the world, and rather being tied to tenets of objectivity and neutrality, 
documentary works in the space between the factual and the mediated as a form of judgmental rationality. And if we zoom in on that cut, the interstitial space, this is where we get at ontological depth at the level at which things are really going on, as Bhaskar said. The ontological depth I'm investigating is that of the Welsh Wales identity. Welsh Wales is defined in Dennis Balsam's model of the divisions of Welsh identity as the industrial, now post-industrial valleys region against the Vrogam Raig, which is the rural Welsh-speaking region, and British Wales, the anglicised region along the border and the enclave um, in West Wales. Welsh Wales is where the internal tensions of Welsh identity are arguably at their most fraught and contested. And given the ambiguity and internal division, identity should be seen as complex, plural, contingent and socially reproduced. And this can be predicated on the critical realist questions, what must exist for the Welsh Wales identity to be what it is, and what causal mechanisms have produced the Welsh Wales identity. Uh, critical engagement with identity can work towards unmasking and unpacking the changing, relatively enduring, structured but composite formations, as described by Mike Wayne, that point to the causal forces underneath identity to render a complex, prismatic account of Welshness. And this is what the work is trying to do on a practical level, working through co the combination of fragments that operate as evidence and as metonymic indexes of causal mechanisms and how juxtaposition as a form of visual metaphor can infer causal structures. This diagram visualizes the stages of the research process and it's premised on the CR approach to hermeneutics and semiotics, and it aims to make the operating principles of realist collage as a form of causal inference transparent across visual forms of abduction, abstraction, and retroduction. It's cyclical and recursive rather than a linear process. Through hermeneutic interpretation of the events, we can move beyond the empirical and the actual towards ontological depth. And although Bhaskar advocated hermeneutics in CR, this comes with the warning that it is the characteristic error of hermeneutics to dissolve in transitivity. But just because our only access to the social world is through interpretive processes, it doesn't follow that this is all that exists. And it does not follow that language uh, and ways of thinking are unconstrained by the world. Language and representations have an indirect relationship with reality, but that relationship isn't arbitrary. The implication is that interpretation can't be considered entirely of our mind. It's not purely transitive. As Kieran Cashel says, interpretation is both, both motivated and determined by socio-historical transitive and existential intransitive factors. Therefore, clearly, interpretation cannot be regarded as irreducibly subjective or relativistic in nature. And in reference to the meaning of archive film, Patricia Zimmer Zimmerman says that film artefacts present a materialization of the abstractions of race, class, gender, and nation as they are lived and a part of everyday life. And the actions, rituals, and behaviours accessible through the archive films are bound up in the system of values and meanings held by the people who were filmed and the people who did the filming. And this means that film fragments can function as metonyms or vectors that point to the social structures that conditioned the events recorded. The first stage of the process is abduction. Abduction means that single events are interpreted as particular instances of more general phenomena. This is an activity that demands a theoretical language that penetrates the empirical surface and forges contact 
with the reality that exists beneath the level of events, wherein individual phenomena are understood as embedded in and an outcome of social structures. In conducting abduction, I have adapted Ron Kynan and Wiltshire's stages of thematic analysis for the purpose of analysing the archive film, where the experiential themes relate to what can be seen in the recorded events, inferential themes relate to what is not directly recorded and observable, but we can reasonably infer exists or has existed, and the dispositional themes indicate the cause of the events recorded, referring to theories about the properties and powers that must exist in order to produce the identity of Welsh Wales. And um, through aggregating ideas from the literature on Welsh identity, these are the causal mechanisms, the constituent components of Welsh identity that I've established. And within working class industrial culture, as an overall heading, we've got sub themes, socialist political consciousness, community values and solidarity and so on. They are overlapping and contradictory. For example, a hostility to Welsh nationalism is part of both working class culture and is within Britishness, but that coexists with the affirmation of Welsh history and cultural life. Also, we have non-conformist Protestantism, um, the pre-industrial rural culture that Raymond Williams described as a residual culture and the effects of the physical environment. And to analyse the archive film, I've gone through it clip by clip and made a note of the experiential themes that then lead to the inferential themes and the dispositional themes list the mechanisms that I feel are at work when it comes to any event recorded. The next stage is abstraction. And given the limits of ordinary perception, reality appears as an undifferentiated, undifferentiated whole. But as Bertel Allman says, reality may be in one piece when lived, but to be thought about and communicated, it must be parceled out. Our minds can no more swallow the world at one sitting than can our stomachs. And even where we are interested in holes, we must select and abstract their constituents. And in substituting a particular effect for a general cause, metonym can work to materialize non-empirical causes, making an abstract reference more concrete. Based on that, I've tried to develop a specific interpretation and application of the role of abstraction within visual research. Whereby when an image is spatially abstracted and removed from its original context, it goes through the movement from the particular to the general that amplifies its function as metonym. So moving on to semiotics, according to Saussure's sign system, a sign contains a signifier, the vehicle of meaning, and the signifier, the concept or meanings attached to the signifier. Being a social convention, the relationship between the two is arbitrary, and there is no natural or fixed connection that's external to language. In developing a CR approach to semiotics, Tobin Nellhouse argues that as the sign can't include what's external to language, it's not compatible with ontological realism, so it cannot be incorporated within CR. Bascar said that the centerpiece of any adequate theory of meaning must be a semiotic triangle that includes the referent in the intransitive dimension as well as the signifier and the signified. Cashal says, if A is the transitive and C is the intransitive, then B is the process of representation that mediates the interaction. The transitive can therefore be recapitulated as the intransitive mediated through representation. 
as the representation is not entirely epistemic and not entirely objective either. It's in the zone occupied by the signifier between the intransitive and the transitive. From here, representation can act as the mediator between the two dimensions. This is my own adaptation of the triangle with realist collage mediating between intransitive mechanisms of identity and transitive knowledge of identity. From this position, it's a catalyst for what Nick Wilson describes as aesthetic experience, which is an experience of being in relation with our own experience, but too between our internal psychic world and the external world of objects, events, and things. The last stage of the process is in the recontextualization of fragments in collage composites as a form of retroduction. When each of the abstracted aspects has been examined, it is possible to combine the abstractions so as to form concepts which grasp the concreteness of the objects through retroduction. But there is some confusion over a clear-cut definition of retroduction and how it differs from abduction. This has led Amber Fletcher to say that descriptions of retroduction are abstract at best. In suggesting a clearer definition, Justin Dragos has said that retroduction and abduction are two sides of a coin. On the one hand, Abductive theorizing is ep epistemological in the sense of directing attention to how we should think in terms of scientific innovation. Retroduction is ontological in the sense of unearthing mechanisms that are part of manifested reality. Creative imagination, abduction is needed to study mechanisms, retroduction. And my interpretation of abduction and retroduction follows this epistemology ontology distinction Abduction is where mechanisms are hypothesized in thought, whereas retroduction following abstraction in my process is where these hypotheses are put into more concrete action. It's in the distinction between imagining mechanisms and then attempting to reveal them through and in practice. In the practical retroduction of realist collage, Metonymic fragments are applied in relationships within visual metaphors to describe non-empirical reality. Paul Lewis argues that he calls generative metaphor allows the conceptualization of the unobservable through invoking more familiar objects and entities. And it's only through critical realist metaphor that such avenues for further exploration come to our attention. I'll just finish with some thoughts on historical narrative in film. I would argue that the more active and critical reception that collage provokes engages with the contingency and, com and complexity of um, a more open and inclusive history. This works against the orthodox and conventional modes of film that are predicated on notions of inevitability, predictability, a linear causality that become binding agents that seem to cement fragments of events into seamless whole stories that satisfy our apparent need for closure. And alternatively, creative mediation can provide the formal and aesthetic aspects that are foregrounded to become the generative element that releases history as a force acting on the present. And I think the political implications of this more critical engagement is that it can engender what Jamie Barron calls contiguity and continuity. Uh, this is where Archive Film asks us to recognise that our context here and now and their context there and then may be extremely similar. Uh, I believe that this in Archive Film can support the production of what Iwan Bala calls custodial aesthetics, an art or media practice with a deep involvement with specific and particular places, history and people.
And this offers a visual, material custodianship of cultural memory and its role in determining the identities of the present. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, if you could stop sharing your slash, yeah. brilliant, yeah. brilliant. Yeah, thank you very much for that. That's the second time I've watched it, and I'm still fascinated. And I'll be watching that several more times to, to get some of that sinking. Because I think for me, that is, it, you know, the use of animation it is quite unique. Um, I've not come across it before, so why I really want you to come today because I think that could really sort of get our kind of imagination going. A, a, a quick or first question before I sort of open it up to everybody else, giving them a chance to think of some questions. Um, well, how did you get into animation, and, and why? What was the what you know, why CR for you? Why why was that? Right. Well, um, I did art and design at undergraduate degree, then I did an MA in illustration and animation. And I was always interested in kind of deploying animation when it came to negotiating cultural and social and political issues. So as I was on my MA, I developed a, a kind of language that was based on, on collage. And then when I started my PhD, uh, I was struggling for a paradigm, uh, a kind of theoretical frame to try to articulate what I was getting at with collage. And I was investigating more uh, subjectivist paradigms like uh, um, phenomenology, for example. And none of it kind of rang true with me. And I was reading a lot of literature in practice research in the arts. And some of it was kind of useful, but no nothing was really presenting itself as something I could really grab hold of to articulate what I was trying to do in, in collage. And what I was looking for was a, a kind of framework for what I think collage does, which is balances the indexical and references to the concrete reality that is uh, indexed through photographic materials and then the iconic language of combining elements so you infer something that is outside of the collage, external to it. And, and then I found critical realism. I was lucky. I mentioned it in something I sent to my supervisor without really understanding what it was. And he said, well, this is this guy called Roy Bascar, and it's quite difficult stuff, but you might want to look at it. It might help. <laughs> it might help you. And I went straight to realist theory of science um, and I, I struggled with it. I, I, at first, as I think people do, but it, it started to really uh, connect with what I wanted to say about what collage does. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, it, it was full of concepts, which I thought could help me articulate what collage is kind of made of and how it operates. And I thought, right, this is it. And I, you know, I thought this this is going to unlock that um for me. And the more I read and the more I I I kind of learned about it, the more it seemed to 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 fit. And and so it went from there. And and, it, and then when I when I started to read about methodology, I know there's a bit of an absence of stuff in critical realism with methodology. I think that's kind of being built on quite a lot now with, um, you know, the, the book by Banfield and my, my Surya and, and other, other bits of literature, which are more recent. Um, and, and then abduction, retroduction and abstraction, that made sense where it came to the, the, the stages of collage. So, yeah, that was it. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, is, has anybody got a question? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, hi, Simon. Go ahead. Mate. Thanks, Mark. Um, and thanks, Mark, for that talk. It was really fascinating. Um, I'm really interested to hear like a bit more about um, Balsam and his categories and, and uh, the Welsh whales, Frog and Rag and British whales. And I was just interested whether you found during your work, whether to what extent you found those categories actually did hold true 
and whether they were kind of rough edges between those categories because I know that model has been around for quite a long time and I mean yeah. I, I live in Wales and spend all my time in Wales and I can think of there are certain places and certain parts of the population where those boundaries really start to merge and, and blur a bit I was just wondering if that came up in your work yeah definitely it's you know it's not it's 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 a general rule, rule of thumb kind of model for the divisions, which hold true to an extent, but it doesn't acknowledge the massive overlap. You know, for example, um, non, non-conformist religion in South Wales comes with a Welsh-speaking culture. I'm from Merth Tidville, and there was a big part of Merth there that was predominantly Welsh-speaking up until the late 60s. So the model suggests a division between Anglophone Welshness and rural first language Welsh speaking Welshness, which is a little bit misleading. It's it's useful as a starting point for where you divide up the identities, but it doesn't acknowledge those overlaps and complexities. Um, and you know, in general, uh, it could be argued based on Britishness and working class culture, there, there is a hostility to Welsh language culture in South Wales, which is definitely true, but it coexists with the affirmation of Welshness and Welsh cultural life. And so it's inherently sort of contradictory and overlapping and, and, and messy. Um, so it's, it's kind of just a, a starting point where you can start to build a model of that identity but it, you know, it, it for, for Welsh Wales identity in particular, it's like a, a it sits in between in a, in a really ambiguous position between a Rogan Rig and British Wales because it kind of combines both elements and it's it's split down the middle in that sense. Where you, the, the I think the model is useful for separating British Wales and the Rogan Rig, but it's less useful for the Welsh Wales identity. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think I think it's fascinating. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, I mean, I'm thinking in particular of, I think uh, surveys about Welsh identity often show that places in the valleys uh, have probably the strongest Welsh identity or the most Welsh. Uh, I seem to remember, and yet the one of some of the lowest Welsh language, uh, speaking populations also. So it's quite, as you say, it's quite an interesting um, mix in that contradiction. And yeah. just um follow up on that I was just wondering I mean you focused on Welsh Wales which is mostly the valleys I'm uh, just wondering you know is that why is that topic so kind of personally important to you and, and what what are you trying to understand on a kind of more personal level about that uh right well that's where I'm from when I moved to Derby when I was 18 so I'm 46 now, so I've spent most of my adult life in England. And, uh, yeah, I don't feel good about it in lots of ways. There's been kind of complex feelings of, I don't know, having left it behind and sort of a little element of betrayal. And uh, my family is still there. And part of it is kind of working through my own feelings about my identity, I I guess, and as well as as that, from, from, there's the personal aspect, uh, which means that I of all identities, I I know it most intimately, of course, uh, uh, and I remember the scant knowledge of Welsh history that I picked up from school, so I had to do quite a lot of reading into into Welsh history at a particular point during PhD, I spent about seven or eight months uh, on on just reading around Welsh history and identity. And it, it when I was looking for subject matter, I, when I started the PhD, uh, I, I didn't know at that point that it was going to be based on Welshness uh, at, at all. Um, it was just going to be about archive film. And um, when I was thinking of a, of a topic and subject matter, I was aware of the archive in the National Library in Aberystwyth, and it seemed to make sense that I would approach them and ask them if I could use their materials. Uh, yeah, so that, that's how I arrived at that. Yeah. Fascinating. Thank you.
Anybody else got a question? I have a very quick question. Um, hi, Jane. Uh, welcome to the group as well. For hi, thank you. It's my you. very first, um, very first meeting. Thank you for for allowing me to join, and I really enjoyed the presentation. Um, my question for Mark is, um, from a theoretical and, and also methodological perspective, I'm I'm interested in the question around the researcher as subject who takes on an object of research. And right. in this particular research, do you think the, the judgmental rationality and ontological depth that you talked about would have been accessible to a researcher who is non-Welsh um, and, and does not share that same, you know, totality of experience and cultural history that you have access to? And secondly, I guess the, the, the follow-up question would be what could be the, the implications for other critical realist researchers, you know, working in, in other areas, for example, in mine, in, in criminology, you know, does it require that level of shared experience and shared life world and cultural history in order to, I guess, communicate that depth of that that level of depth that you have access to and in a way that you're able to see the metaphors that others may not be able to see yeah thank you uh i don't think that it's only accessible exclusively to welsh people uh i think if you had a good knowledge of what are potentially the mechanisms and the structures of Welsh identity, then you could potentially undertake this work, regardless of where you were from. And that would be a matter of engaging with the literature. And I've started with Welsh identity, and I'm hoping that I've developed a, a model that could be applied to other regional archives. So I would hope that I could take my model and apply it to a Scottish regional archive or one from the north of England or elsewhere. And not being from there wouldn't preclude me from undertaking the same process. I would just have to do my homework and and uh, understand what the identity was comprised of. Um, it, in, in that, it, it would be useful to collaborate with people possibly from that region uh, and who would be more embedded in it than me. I suppose, you know, in, in terms of Welshness, being from that region and understanding it with a level of intimacy, it, it, uh, I, I, I would be more in touch with what, I, I don't know, Raymond Williams would call it the structure of feeling of, of Welshness, um, which is something that is ambiguous and unnecessarily... Uh, in, intangible and hard to quantify and, 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 and measure. And part of the process is me working through that relationship I have with an identity which is my own, which is which I couldn't bracket off and exclude from the work and 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 describe as an important or irrelevant. Of course it's relevant, but I don't think that would preclude someone else undertaking the same work. And I hope to to work with other archives, and um, I, I wouldn't exclude myself from that. And, and second part of your question was, how is this relevant to uh, other uh, fields? Yeah, yeah, the broader implications for critic, realist, yeah. informed dreams. Um, well, uh, hopefully, so, it, it when it comes to the the practical application of of critical realism which I know there's a bit of an absence in the literature. I hope some of what I, I, I've done when I managed to publish some of it, hopefully, um, that would have some resonances with how people might apply critical realism more practically across disciplines. How that would manifest, you know, I, I don't know. But I think what I've tried to do in developing a form of visual research is that visual research being more 
widely applicable to the humanities in in general uh, rather than just media and art and design this could form part of a project the, the, the visual research could form part of a project which would entail other forms of research as well and then it could fit in to a broader project that may entail um, a, a range of different methods. Um, and if anyone working in any field wanted to adopt visual research, and it wouldn't necessarily be just pertaining to archive film, it could be to any visual material, um, then what I've done might be relevant to that. Yeah, hi Mark. I thought that that was um, that was really impressive—a tour de force application of critical realism, yes, um, and a really elegant application of it as well, and an uncompromising one. I find that when I'm using CR in lectures to students, I end up having to dilute things and just almost lose the will and just really um, just. Uh, jettison the concepts entirely and just start using commonplace language so that was quite inspiring hearing the application of abduction retroduction done so uh, uncompromisingly um okay. yeah I, I wanted to ask it's more of a technical question i suppose i noticed that all of the causal mechanisms from your thematic analysis were yeah. pre-existing citations is yeah. that because all of the research is from archives or what's what's with that uh that's all in reference to the literature Right, okay. and identity and so one of the things that worked quite well really with um, that aspect was that when I started to read the literature uh, the, the way that Welsh identity was described seemed to resonate with critical realism lots of talk metaphorical talk of layers and strata and powers that <laughs> I, I felt like I had that kind of very clear relationship where I could take that literature and make it fit into a CR model quite well. Um, and so those references are to points in the literature where a specific aspect of Welsh identity is described and so when I re done enough reading I've still got more to do I was able to kind of bring that together and form categories with sub elements within them and identify where they overlap and contradict and and and, and so on and because that when I was looking at the archive film I, I needed a a, a clear system for how I, I would categorise each clip and where they would fit. And I, I was really struggling with that uh, at one point. So when I read um, Gareth Wiltshire's and uh, Ron Kynan's thematic analysis article, that really, really helped a lot. That That is what nailed that part of the system down for me. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, cheers. Um... Mark, I mean, I, I don't know if you watched last month, we had um, uh, Dave Elder Vass and he was talking about um, norm circles and leaning on yeah. critical realism of a very social constructionism way. He, he mentioned the sort of social construction of Scotland as an identity born out of separate plans. What, what would you make of that in regards to, you know, in correlation with your work? Um, I haven't caught up with his video yet. Okay. I, I will do. What was he... What was he? So he's basically saying, oh, you know, it's brutally yeah. form, you know, you know, but leaning very much on social constructionism, uh, yeah. and basically, you know, you get these these norm circles, okay, yeah, yeah, and yeah. You get group identity. Yeah. Um, but for for me, it seems what you're doing with Welsh identity seems to be a lot more finesse, especially with the the access to the real. So yeah. see how that, I mean, for me, I think that's one of the most difficult things to do, and and one of the reasons why I was inspired when I heard your talk first of all is access to the real via that cut yeah and, i mean I, so i don't know what, what you would i mean would you would you sort of say that the normal circle would not be quite adequate or yeah um so far uh norm circles i'm aware of that as a concept but i 
haven't applied it to my own work. I need to do a little bit more <laughs> reading there, to be honest. Um, but I, I, I think it does resonate with the idea of identity, especially in how they are formed and, and sort of sustained. And I think um, where, where that kind of perhaps fits with my con concept of identity is that I think there's a dichotomy in identity in that, on the one hand, it tries to form relatively secure boundaries between us within the identity and them outside, on the one hand. But then because it's naturally full of contradictions and tensions, then um, the, the the boundary is always kind of insecure and fluid and, and malleable. That's like the kind of dichotomy of identity. And that kind of resonates with what I know of norm circles, although, you know, that is limited at the moment. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. That kind of push and pull and, and, and that, that tension and... And it, it feels, I mean, from what you, it feels very dialectical from what yeah. you're saying, is, you know, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. Yeah. You yeah. Know, and, and sort of the angle sort of dialectic tension there, you know. Um, is it, has anybody else got any questions at all? No. Okay. Um, well, I've got one last question for you. Okay. And it's a bit of a joke one, but are you a big fan of, uh, Monty Python's at all. Oh, the Terry, Terry Gilliam stuff. Yeah, yeah, I love that stuff. Yeah. Um, and, and is there any kind of, when, when we're looking at sort of uh, crime, security and justice, are there any areas you would think of from what you've watched in the media, any areas where you can see that cut and you can see that inconsistencies and contradictions? I mean, if you look at recent conflicts, for instance, you know, we've got a couple of active war zones at the moment. Is it easy for you to see that kind of contradiction and the breakdown of those narratives? Uh, yeah, it it kind of comes down comes down to the issue of visibility and what is made invisible and what is suppressed in media representation. And I guess that ideologically speaking, that representation can either aim to reveal com causal complexity or it can actively aim to suppress it. Um, and what I'm trying to do with collage, I suppose, for thought of as a kind of technology of seeing is to try and position it as something which enables visibility. Um, and, you know, for, for example, representation of South Wales over the last few years has been universally kind of really pernicious and negative mm -hmm. through um, uh, poverty porn programming and uh, for example and so going back to an earlier question one of the reasons I wanted to 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 deal with South Wales is to try and project a much more complex image of our history and identity to challenge those reductive representations where the visibility of complexity is collapsed. Yeah. So that's what it's about for me. Yeah. Because as you were saying, I was thinking about whole Attar with primary and secondary drivers with media, with the media. You know, yeah. if you illuminate for that cut, you, you're seeing behind the scenes and you can actually probably get access to the people who are primarily driving that suppression. Yeah. yeah. Or illumination and, and yeah, it's because if if that cut and the construction of representation is is foregrounded, mm -hmm. then the construction of all representation is highlighted and it and it provokes that more active uh, spectatorship from the viewer, where they are thinking about the, why has this clip been included. And what does it mean? Yeah. So rather than the passive viewing where ideology becomes invisible, the more constructed language um, is, is re reveals um, the politics of representation. You know, uh, can I ask another question on, on that, Matt? Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Do you think with the advent of social media, that's the complexity is now increasing with that that, that framing? Yes. 
yeah, with social media, sorry. Um, yeah, they do you think they complex, you know, with, with social media, the complexity of, of running a particular narrative by people who want to either c- compress or, or, or yeah. illuminate, you know, yeah. you've got a yeah. lot more narratives going on. I mean, quite often, yeah. you know, if I go on the, the generic news, you can see a story, but you then go, say, on Twitter, Twitter and then yeah. you can find out a, a very different angle. I mean, I did it with not the most recent conflict, the conflict before, where a particular narrative was given on, on, on a particular incident in the war, I don't want to go to details of it, but then I accidentally come across Twitter and it, it totally, totally. Took, it, took the narrative the other way. And you're thinking, well, these main institutions, I mean, this was the BBC, I think, you know, must have known that other narrative. So you, you, you know, you even, so you were getting a suppression of, of the truth by the a main media outlet, even though they were critical of other, other nations' media outlets. Yeah, yeah. It yeah. was really intriguing. Yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. We we are, uh, are bombarded with so much visual information now, and um, it's uh, really difficult to navigate. It's totally bewildering. Um, one of the dangers, of course, through uh, artificial intelligence, is that images will become less and less reliable, and their truth value will be more and more um, destabilized. So one of the kind of points that I was trying to get at through um, how I frame collage is the importance of that link to ontological realism and uh, events and maintaining a sense of the of the of the concrete and yeah. and um, challenging those destabilized representations with. Uh, particularly in um, the way visual effects technologies uh, are now being applied to uh, media, in that visual effects technologies, their logic it tends to be to create a kind of seamless realism where the, the distinct identities of layers is um, suppressed. And so this is a form of collage where the connection of layers is is foregrounded and is and is uh, announced, and that provokes a more kind of active spectatorship uh, uh, again. Is it, you know, it's a it's a it's a very kind of old idea. It goes back to the very early days of of film with um, the Russian construct constructivists and the Russian montage movement, um, and the Russian montagists felt that you could only deal with reality in film through the process of editing, where um, truth was revealed in the editing and the construction. So it's a, it's an old idea, but uh, but one of the reasons I I was so pleased when I found um, critical realism is that it was a, a, a brilliant way of explaining what's going on in, in that, I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and ever more important because of the creation of AI, you know, I follow quite a few blogs and and, and uh, podcasts and you know, recent people, you know, saying that the, the release of AI com- is potentially quite a dangerous thing. So, mm-hmm. so your work is, is even more important than ever. Thank, well, I hope so. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, is it? Thank you, Mark. Is, is anybody got any other questions at all? No. Okay. Well, um, I will wrap it up there. Mark, thank you so much for tonight. Again, it's fascinating. Well, well, Again, well. I will watch this tomorrow whilst I'm editing it. We'll put up on YouTube for it for the rest of our group to, to watch, what have you. Uh, and, and just a really inspiring, you know, to reiterate what Orlando said, bit of applied CR. And I, and I think as a group, that's what we're really looking for, you know, to, to see how people are actually really applying it and, and, and helping it to make the difference. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thanks very much for asking me. Uh, I've enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks everyone thanks for coming. Again. Cheers. Thank, Thank you. you.